Hello. How, How are you doing? Are? How are you doing? Tell us. Tell us everything. This is great live TV. I know. We love hearing everything. Especially in this, like, the, in the gap in the moment where we don't hear anything. And we don't I know. know we're we have there. no idea if there's anyone watching at all. But we're happy. We're fine. We're go oh! Hi, Wendy. Wendy. In you came. Boom. Under the wire. Pew, pew, pew. I always feel like there's always the one pew, person. Pew. Who comes in ahead of the rest? And it's like they hi know from things. Utah, Jenna or Jane. Hey. Jane, hi from Utah. Hi, hi to Utah. Oh, everyone, we're back. We're back. We were back. We are back from our vacation. Yeah, our beach we, vacation we went to a land beyond internet. A land where the deer did come and eat from our hands. No, they didn't actually eat from our hands, but they didn't come and give me a tick. They did give her a tick, and she got <laughs> she got lost. I got lost on a town. <laughs> With one street, <laughs> with a tick on her, sending text in capital letters. I have a tick and I'm lost. I have a tick and I'm lost. <laughs> Running up and down the one street. That was terrible. It was Hi, Donna. Hi, Diane. Hi, Teresa. Hi, Shana. Oh, wait. It's Shana from Tucson. Hello, Kathy from Ohio. And Wendy says she almost, Donna says she almost beat Wendy. Mm. Next week, next week, rematch. It's like Chris Everett and Martina Navratilova for those of you who are a million years old. Hi, Trisha. Hi, MJ. Hi, Gail. Gigi. And Penny. Gigi. And Brooke. And Karen. Woo! We're over 100 people. It's time to begin. It's Everyone's to ready begin for not letting the bastards grind us down. Yeah. Bastards, this is how do you say ba bastards? Bastards! Only after you've said ba it, I, I, I'm, I'm all confused in my mouth. Can't sound <laughs> confused in don't my mouth. Don't let the two, me. Don't let the bustards get you down. Do you know what a bustard is? I don't. It's Tell a me. vulture. Oh, like a buzzard. Yeah, bustard is another word. Don't let the bustards grind you down. I thought it was don't let the bastards get you down. And I've known this for discussion. a long time. Do you all have your like shot glasses in hand? Because. Don't let the bastards grind you down is from the unofficial fight song of Haven. Drink, drink, where I did go for many years, um, and it's it's illegitimate non non kabaram dum, dominisa un pak illegitimate non kabaram dum. It goes on. That yes. was Latin. That was fake Latin, it's but fake she Latin. didn't just say the F and word. It fakely she means didn't say it. No, no, I would never. Um, it means don't let the bastards grind you down that shows you how little latin i know never went to harvard still uh, got it right i'm like i have i have little latin and less greek like who else oh shakespeare <laughs> according to samuel johnson i'm just saying all of us have little latin and less greek so there should i add to the drinking game um whenever martha compares herself to william shakespeare <laughs> <laughs> we don't really drink it we have the same high forehead me and Shakespeare. And the same okay. neck rubs. All right, I'm out. I'm out. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah. Somebody said they, they wanted to see more greenery, like in California. So I put up a painting I did at the ranch in California and a plant. So um, I hope that makes you all feel better. And don't let the bastards grind you down. Let's talk about this. So on our vacation, I was talking to a dear friend about... The concept of tribal shaming. Now, some of you may know of whom I speak. The, the, the phrase tribal shaming comes from a book by, now I forgot it again, Mario Martinez. Mario Martinez. Marmar, -mar, I call him. And here's the basic idea. Humans are social primates. That means we cannot live without a tribe of some kind. I mean, defined as a, a community, a family, however you want to say it, a, a congregation. You got to have a tribe or you never make it to a year old, right? Child without a tribe, dead. So we have this primal need to belong to our circle of acquaintances and all circles of acquaintances create cultures and all cultures have rules. And some of the rules, which no one ever says, but everyone knows are rules about how far you can go and still belong to the tribe. So there's an outward edge and people know that you don't do the things that take you out of the group. And when you start to go in that direction, what happens is the, the group tries to reestablish itself by pulling you back into it. And the primary means of doing this is shame. 
Now, some of you may have been in my sociology 101 class in, oh my Lord, it was like the 1990s. It was a thousand years ago. And one of the assignments that we had was that I wanted to show the students that laws and policies do not shape human behavior. Like we all, I don't know, break the speed limit, go through a, a red stoplight at three in the morning when there's not another car in the street, whatever. So that's breaking the law. We ignore policies often, like political policies, but we're very aware of shaming. So what I had these students do, if you're one of them, welcome back, is go do something that breaks the law but doesn't cause any problem for anyone, like jaywalk. Okay, that's technically against the law. Doesn't cause a problem. Then do something that does not break the law but pushes the boundaries of your culture to the point where they will shame you. Oh my God, these college students were so great. They were so willing to do radical things. One guy, and this was the 1990s and it was in Utah, okay? I was, this was when I was getting my, I was still finishing my doctorate at Harvard, drink, drink. But I was teaching um, part-time at, at BYU, which is a Mormon school in a Mormon community. And some of these kids, one of them went out and, uh, he put a sign on himself that said, I am a gay man looking for like gentle companionship, call this number. And he put it on a sign on his chest and walked through the mall and then had other students go behind him video, secretly videotaping, probably illegal right there, secretly videotaping people's reactions like, ah! So that was very brave of him. My favorite was this woman, young woman, who went home for Thanksgiving. And for those of you who aren't in the U.S., Thanksgiving has a very specific menu in the U.S. It is turkey, roast turkey, mashed potatoes, stuffing, bread stuffing in the turkey. Um, some people have like green bean casserole. Some people do sweet potatoes, candied yams, different things. But it's a very gooey meal on the whole. <laughs> it's not finger food. This woman went home with her huge Mormon family, like, 27 people around some huge table and she ate the whole Thanksgiving meal with her hands without using the silverware and what happened was that conversation got quieter and quieter and quieter and she was just nom 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 and they're all eating like mm -hmm. and they got more and more silent until there was just dead silence everybody clinking away except for her she was still eating with her hands and then her father jumped up at the head of the table and just screamed, I can't take this anymore, and ran from the room. That's the effect of breaking a culture's norms, okay? There's nothing illegal about it. There's nothing unhealthy about it. It's just, I mean, she washed her hands. It just breaks the norms and people can't handle it. And most of us are deeply ashamed to get that reaction from people, that they would just start staring at us because we're weird and then maybe run from the room. So the conflict arises when we start doing things that violate the laws of our or the norms of our culture because it's right for us on the inside. So at those points, what happens is we need we feel a need individually to move toward a behavior that the culture doesn't like, and so the culture tries to pull us back in. So I always I always like to talk about the fact that it's so odd that I went to Harvard drink. To, to choose to have a child with Down syndrome who was prenatally diagnosed. And then I moved to Utah to recover from that and chose to become a lesbian in Mormonville. So that's not okay with either culture. And I got tribally shamed in both places. So um, when I was pregnant with Adam, uh, a doctor came in and told me that I was making a huge mistake and that it was, um, he said, it, it's not, not a mistake that you're the, only woman I've ever known to make this choice and also by far the youngest, you know, like you don't know what you're doing. And he said, it's like having a malignant tumor. He said, I can't force you to let me take it out, but you know, it's your funeral. And I was looking at him thinking, ah, so why do you look so scared? And you know, when an advisor told me I had to institutionalize the kid or my career was over and I, there was a lot of tribal shaming. So I, I fled to Utah thinking this culture will like me. And only to realize that uh, I wasn't so down with Mormonism, really. Like, I didn't actually believe it. And then that I wanted, that I didn't think that there was anything wrong with the three great dangers 
to the community, the Mormon community in those days was, it had been defined by one of the church leaders as intellectuals, uh, feminists, and homosexuals. At the time I thought, ooh, I'm two for three. A few years later, unmarried my husband, fell in love with a woman, whoa, with three strikes, I was out. And of course I got a bunch of tribal shaming for that. Uh, you know, weird anonymous faxes, people actually coming to my door and telling me I was going to hell. Um, people turning their backs on me as I walked down the street. Um, people turning their backs to me when I walked into a lunchroom. It was quite, it was intense. So this is what I want to say to you. If you get to a place in your life where to go forward as an individual in your integrity means that you are bursting the bounds of the cultural norm, you will be grabbed at and dragged back. People will threaten you with all kinds of weird things. They'll, they'll punch your buttons as, as best they can. This is the point at which you must not let them grind you down. And our friend on vacation gave me uh, she she does workshops where she teaches how to do this. And I'm not going to steal her whole workshop, but I am going to pass along one tidbit that is just too fabulous not to pass along. And that is that most of us, when we're breaking the bonds of community, so say I, you know, I was leaving Mormonism and Mormon people, dearly beloved people were bursting into tears and saying, you know, it would be better if you were dead. You're going to... You're going to destroy all of us. You're going to destroy yourself. You're going to hell, all the rest of it. Um, at that point, we tend to say, okay, but this is what I'm doing for my own integrity. We try to spell it out. We try, we say, I love you so much. I'll always love you, but I can't agree with you on this and this and this. And we try to get them to agree with us. They're never going to agree with us. If they do, like, you can't afford to wait around for that when your integrity is telling you to do one thing and the culture is pulling you back. This is the genius of my friend's method. You sit down and you think of the one person you would have to betray the most to be your true self. Yeah, can you think of that? Then don't worry, you don't have to go up to them, don't have to say anything to them, but you write them a letter and here's the important part. You don't say, I'm not betraying you, I'm not abandoning you, you say, guess what? I am going to betray our culture. I am going to abandon our culture. I'm going to abandon the norms of this group. I'm going to seriously betray what you believe in. And you don't qualify it and you don't dress it up in loving language and you don't try to be the good guy. You acknowledge that yes, in fact, you are breaking the rules and you are in that sense, betraying the social contract. Taking that like on the chin, realizing that it's okay. You can hold the, the your ground as someone who's betrayed a system. That's what gives people the courage to leave the mafia, to stop practicing slavery, to um, leave cults. You know, everything that tries to catch us and and hold us in is not equally worthy of our allegiance. Some of it deserves to be betrayed. And the only way we can make that distinction is within ourselves. So of course it's not meant to cause harm. Of course it's not meant to hurt anyone. It's not meant to hurt anyone's feelings. It's just a step that takes us outside the bounds of our culture. And it is betraying and abandoning those rules, that set of cultural norms. So then you write a letter back from that person and it's the letter they could never ever write in a million years, which says, oh, I totally get it. And here's why I will always love you and understand you. And um, Mario Martinez says that this is a letter that is purely from your imagination. But my friend says, it's probably the truth. It's actually a letter from the soul, which always wants another soul to be free. So you've heard me talk about spider love, how spiders really genuinely love flies and they express their love by trapping the flies, wrapping them up and sucking the life force out of them. They love them the way I love, I don't know, chocolate. That's spider love. The difference between real love and spider love is that the function of real love is always, always, always 100% of the time to set the beloved free. So anyone who sees you leaving the fold and wants to yank you back if they hear and see what you do in, in your integrity, is, is given a choice whether to love you like a spider or like freedom. 
And if they choose to love you like freedom, their mind is going to have to open a little. And that makes them more able to navigate according to their integrity. So the truth sets us free and nobody needs to be ground down by all those pressures. So now I'm going to ask the gracious badger to come back and read us some questions. Because these ask questions. Yes, questions. Questions are nice. Yes. That's Do we have the any chair questions? making those noises, not me. <laughs> yes. Not my body. <laughs> okay. All righty. So here we have a question from Donna. Reliably, how do you fully grasp your integrity and what? Oh, I lost her. Hmm? I'm it's sorry. Up here. And what you want to do when the fear of rejection of the tribe has you drowning in anxiety? For example, I know I want a different life, but I am too afraid to identify where I need to break free. You know, um, feel the fear and do it anyway is the is the short answer. A slightly longer answer is Anais Nin's famous quote. And then came the day when the courage it took to remain tied in a bud became greater than the courage it took to, to blossom. So sometimes just the pain of not being yourself forces you to open up even though you are afraid. Another technique is get help, get a therapist, get a therapy group so that you have another tribe to go to. That can reduce the fear a lot. And if you have really massive chronic anxiety, go see a psychiatrist. I mean, I, I think that medications are overused in our culture, but I also think I'm really grateful that the first time I ever had to write a poem when I was 15 years old and I didn't sleep for five days, they had Valium for me to take for three days so that I could sleep again and write my first poem and break through my fear of the written word. So now they're gonna be angry and shouting for anybody. I'm sorry if that's a trigger for anybody. I don't mean you should rely on chemicals, but go see it, go see a doctor. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm being practical about this stuff. Absolutely. I have this amazing question from Kathy Kozak. Hmm. Where might we unknowingly be grinding someone else ah, down? Anywhere. Oh, you're so good. Anywhere you feel yourself passing judgment. So you may be making judgments about people like, ah, crystal meth. It's not affecting my cousin all that well. I don't think I'll, I'll go that direction myself. But if you're passing judgment, if you're saying, oh, that little... So, you know, a little bastard, he is just, I'm, he is so, like, he's always been in trouble. He's just, he's going to ruin his life. If you've got that feeling of attacking someone, you're doing grinding down behavior. And even your energy will feel like grinding down to them. And guess what? It will make them turn to crystal meth more. So it's not useful. Um, and it's a very good question to ask. Most yeah. of us, yeah. I call them errors of righteousness. A lot of the worst things we do come when we're feeling very high and mighty. Mm. So if you ever get that feeling, you're you have become one of the illegitimate, illegitimate, illegitimate. I don't even know how they say it. I thought it was illegitimate. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and it won't feel good. No. You know, if you're thinking someone should change their life and it doesn't, you know. Yeah. Um, okay, so here, there's there's a good one. Um, Karen says, what if you want to belong but you won't be accepted in? That is a perennial problem. Everybody wants to belong all the time, and we're always afraid that we won't be fully accepted. That is the thing that keeps us on the hook, doing stuff that isn't good for us in order to maybe, maybe buy love from our tribe. And it's that single thing where you choose your culture over your nature is where you betray yourself. Here's what I found out. If you're willing to betray your culture and go with your nature, what happens is that you come into alignment with truth, right? So, okay, they're not going to accept me, but what do I believe? All right, so I don't, in my case, I don't believe in Mormonism, but what do I believe? Okay. Mm. Um, all right, let me see what I do believe. What feels resonant in my body? What I've had psychic experiences. I've had spiritual experiences. I don't believe in material rationalism without any spiritual element. That's that's another culture that could snag me in, right? Don't admit it, Harvard, drink, that you've had a spiritual experience unless you want to get seriously ground down. Um, what happens though when you get in line with your true beliefs is a kind of inner harmony. And in, in my experience and in the experience of many people that are coached and talked to, you also get in harmony with the force, right? Like there is 
this loving, powerful presence that comes to help you feel held and connected and one with itself. You feel one with everything. So you cannot be left out. It's ridiculous. It's like saying to a drop of water that it doesn't it doesn't belong in the ocean anymore. It, it's, it's there, it's connected. So you get to this place where you can't be disconnected. And then you can love everyone and you can walk out of any social system and still love the people who are there and they can still, they can think whatever you like. As Byron Katie says, when I go into a room, I know that everyone there loves me. I'm, I just don't count on them to already know it. So you can always feel connected and, you can't really be controlled at that point. Yeah, and just on a, on a practical level, I know you don't want to steal our friend's exercise, but one of the things she was saying to us is that when this type of shaming happens, it's about saying you have no honour. Like it's about, and so if you define your own honour system, ah, that's right, you know, uh, and and like even write that down, that that you can actually um, see whether or not you want to be belonging in that group. Does that mm, yeah. if that's a group that would that would make you change who you are to belong to it. Yeah, the last time we had the gathering room, I think we did the values exercise where you mm -hmm. have a verb and an adverb that like daring greatly or loving courageously or whatever that you def with which you define the central core value of your life. And one of the things you can ask when somebody starts pressuring you to belong is, do the rules of that culture harmonize with that core value of mine? So mine was being aware of the presence of the divine continuously. I know that's more than two words, but um, Harvard. <laughs> um, so which cultures jive with that? Well, this culture does. Yeah. Um, a lot of people do. A lot of people do. I think a lot of people are on that wavelength with me and they don't mind. And it's pretty mellow. I thought I'd be thrown out of everything, but it turns out no. Yeah, people are kind. People are good. They are good. Um, oh. Although Stephen Craig wants to know this cracks me up. What is it like getting a hate? I gotta pack? tell you, Stephen, it is <laughs> one of the creepiest, the creepiest things that could possibly happen to you. This was, you know, a thousand years ago when all our implements were made of wood, and <laughs> even the, our fax machine. Yes, the wooden fax machine. Machine. It was so creepy because it'd be in my office. I'd be like late at night. It would go. <laughs> And then it would start cranking out that that weird flimsy paper that we now know to be incredibly bad, like it causes all kinds of diseases or something. It would, it would be like, and then see this scrawl, the handwritten scrawled note. Oh my God. I'm gonna drag you behind a truck until your arms and legs fall off. And it would be coming, you know, you didn't know who it was from. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun to be Mormon. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was fun to be Mormon and openly questioning the faith. Yeah, sounds like it. All right, Teresa wants to know more about the difference between making judgments and passing judgments. Mm, yeah, perhaps a whole gathering room on this. Yes. A whole chapter in my new book is is about that. Your book. Yeah, and um, it's it it really is in the feeling. Like you have to make discernments between things. They say in you know in Buddhist lore it says once you have no preferences you can't be made unhappy everything is as good as everything else um and i asked <laughs> i was talking to my friend stephen who's a you know a former buddhist monk and he said something about how he really didn't like this one author but he really liked a different one and i said but i thought you believed that there were no nothing was better than anything else and he said no it isn't everything is equally good and i said so how come you love this author more than another? And he said, it is also true that one is better than the other. <laughs> and I'm like, you got away with that because you're a Buddhist and then you guys get to talk paradoxically. <laughs> um, but discerning what you like and what feels good to you is a matter of, um, it's a matter of harmony. Do you choose something that feels like it's stuck in your throat or do you choose something that feels like fresh water on a hot day? And if it feels like fresh water on a hot day, you choose it. And if it feels like a, a rock stuck in your throat, it's not so good for you. That's making a judgment. Passing judgment is when you're like, yeah, I know people who do that. 
and they are they are just cruising for a bruising and i don't like the way you do that and the way you do that is bad but, you know the person who voted a different way for me is just stupid or evil or you know we got to get past that there's a lot of passing judgment in our um, media culture these days and online the bullying the name calling the ranting um it's meant to harm and I actually use errors of righteousness to substitute for what Dante called sins of violence, because all physical violence starts with psychological violence and all psychological violence starts with judging another person as less correct than you. So the moment you go into a judgment where it's an attack, you have basically initiated what starts all violence. It otherizes people. It says, I am a good thing and you are a bad thing. I belong, you're out. So as soon as you start thinking of yourself as good and the other as bad, you're in passing judgment territory and you are part of the forces of violence. That's it. That's awesome. <laughs> there is going to be a whole chapter of that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's an interesting question from Cheryl. She says, What stories do we tell ourselves that might bind us down? They're always about how we're not lovable and we don't belong. There you go. So yeah, I'm not good enough. If people knew me, they wouldn't love me. Uh, I'm, I'm never included. No one wants me. No one wants the real me. They only want me because I do things for them. It's always, it's that whole thing of being a social primate and needing a troop. It's always that we, we push away from our true selves by saying we don't belong. That was something I only realized this last week. That's what I've been writing about now, that I I'm writing about lying. And it turns out the only reason we lie, I've been tracking people's lies and putting everyone through quizzes. At the root of every single lie, even the ones that are protecting crime, is the, the fear, I am not loved, I don't belong. That's it is so fun hanging out with her when she's in the middle of writing a chapter. I'm <laughs> just like, you guys, get off the beach. I'm gonna put you through a quiz about lying. Awesome fun. Okay, great question from Donna. We still have time. How do you let go of the love you may have for the tribe, knowing that you do not belong in that oh, tribe? You never let go of no love. No, you couldn't let go of love if you tried. That's not even possible. It's just attachment that you let go of. So you can love everything, but as long as there's no pushing and pulling, no grasping and aversion, there's freedom and the love just is it's it's what you're made of it's what it's your essence so you can't stop it but you can notice where you're attached where you you think you need people to be a certain way or do a certain thing or you just you can't tolerate the world anymore that's attachment and you can feel it you can feel yourself grasping any feeling of grasping is not love it's spider love it's attachment and real love sets the beloved free. So as someone sets you free, you also set the whole group free to be themselves. It's fine. Of course, you'll always love me. You just don't have to always explain that. <laughs> Sandy asks, would codependency also be grinding someone down? Um, on either side of the codependency. So if you're, say, the addict in a codependent relationship, their addiction would definitely be grinding you down. If you're a codependent where you're you're obsessed with what other people think of you and how they behave and you're trying your whole addiction is on controlling another person's behavior, often by being nice or sweet or doing all the right things, um, your own attachment to controlling them is what wears you down. The addict is just oh. like, I don't care, I'm off getting high. No, it's your mm -hmm. obsession with controlling someone who cannot be controlled that grinds you down in that case. So if you think it's them, Take the focus off, get it back on yourself. That's how you get out of codependency. There you go. Boom. Harvard drinks. <laughs> Thank you, Harvard. <laughs> well, do we have a last little we question? Have last one. Or mm -hmm. do you want to just sort of finish up with nice. the wise words? Ooh, yeah. Oh. Um, how do you want to feel better? Hey, wait, let's go back to that one. Go on then. Do you mind? Let's oh. go for this one. How do you put it up on the thingy? This is so fun watching this. I, I have to put it, it up on the thingy. Okay, look for the thing. Press the okay. button. Oh, now, can you read it? <laughs> <laughs> I can't read it. I had eye surgery. It's great, but I can't read it. Oh, <laughs> thank God.
Read it. Said, How to move on or feel better when you've tried for years to be liked by your family and realize it'll never be enough. How do I stop feeling invisible? It comes with me everywhere now. Work, grocery store, at home. Yeah, it does. It's a lie. It's a it's a big lie, and it will hurt you. And the good news is you don't have to get those people to agree with that you're a good person. You just have to get some people to agree that you're a good person. Um, there are those of us who believe that you are valuable and precious simply because you exist and because you have feelings. Uh, there are lots of people who are going to Al-Anon meetings and go, because what you are, dear, is codependent. If you're obsessed with your what your family thinks of you, as one of my therapists once said to me, you're codependent when you're obsessed with your fantasies about other people's fantasies about you. If you're feeling that way, get me to an al Arm group or to a group therapy session or someplace where you'll have a gang of people, heck, an assertiveness training course. I don't care. Just a group of people who can say, yeah, me too. Sucks. We're together, though. All our families hate us. So <laughs> and then it turns out you formed another family and they don't hate you. There's as many families as there are people in the world. So thank you for coming and gathering with us. Thank you very much. That gives us a circle of people, yeah. a tribe to belong to. We won't yeah, shame you. you. There's no shaming here. There's no passing judgment. We love you. Just be, come do what you want. Do as whatever. long as you every week tune in, and, no matter what. And I'll put up a plan. I'll do anything to please you. <laughs> Honestly, I'll do what I can within reason. All right. <laughs> All see right. you next week. Love you. Love bye, you. Bye, 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 b